Yes, God is good for food. Yes, God is good for food. We've tasted and we testify that God is good for food. Again, yes, God is good for food. Amen. For food, we taste it and we testify that God is good for food. Amen. God is good for food. <laughs> The title of this message is The Secret of Living the Christian Life to Be an Overcomer, which is taking the way of eating and enjoying Christ as the tree of life. In this message, saints, we hope to answer two basic questions fundamental but very important questions related to our experience. The first is, how do we eat Christ? We've been talking in all the meetings about this revelation that God presents himself as food, especially as the tree of life. That's the first vision of the Bible that we'll see. Governs all the visions in the Bible. But, but then... How do we eat? And, and I believe that probably most of the saints, uh, maybe the first thought we have is related to the Word. Is that so? And this is true. And this is true. And actually it's one of the points here. But I'd like to let you know that in, in this message, in this outline, there are four points concerning how to eat. And I do hope that as we listen, uh, we would have a kind of prayerful attitude and receive these points and even have our thought expanded concerning how to eat Christ in our daily life. The second question is, why is it that sometimes we do eat but either we have little to no enjoyment. Has this ever been your experience? Or we do not experience the full effectiveness of our eating. Have you experienced this? <laughs> or maybe at one time in your life, in your Christian life, you ate, and there was some impact. You could tell. But later on, maybe even lately, you eat, but there's not the full effect of what we eat. Well, we'll get into those, these two points as, as we go along. Uh, let's come right to the outline, <clears throat> Roman 1. The secret of living the Christian life, to be an overcomer, is for us to take the way of eating and enjoying Christ as the tree of life. God does not intend for us to do anything for him. His only desire is to give himself to us as food for our enjoyment. Only those who take the way of enjoying Christ as the tree of life will see their living and work remaining in the new Jerusalem. This points really links all the previous messages and repeats this vision, which, which our brother, remember in, in the first evening, those excerpts, which our dear brother Lee, when he saw this vision, what an impact in his life. And we pray that we also could have the experience of impact from vision resulting in a drastic change of concept. You know, here we have two verses, one from Genesis and one from Revelation. And they both mention the tree of life. Saints, I hope that we could be impressed with, with, with this view. Regarding the relationship of God with man, the first mention of this relationship involves the tree of life. 
God puts this man in front of the tree of life. In one writing, Brother Lee says this, this is the first vision of the Bible, Genesis 2. And this vision governs all the visions in the Bible. You know, when you study the Bible, there is this principle that we need to study and understand. That is the principle of first mention. And when something is first mentioned in the Bible and you see that point, actually that principle governs the development of that matter all the way to the consummation. And the first time that we see God dealing with man, what does he do? He puts this man in front of a tree. And he does not tell him to worship. He doesn't, you don't see this concept in Genesis 1 and 2 about worship or service. Do this, do that. What do you see? It seems like the only thing God talked to him about is be careful about your eating. Because God knew if you eat wrong, you will be wrong. If you eat the right thing, you will be the right person for his economy, for his purpose. The tree of life in Genesis 2 accomplishes the purpose of God in Genesis 1. Or I should say, man's eating of the tree of life in Genesis 2 accomplishes that purpose in, in Genesis 1. And saints, from beginning to end, we can see God presents himself to man as food. God's relationship with his people in both the Old and New Testament, it reveals this matter of food. You just consider the children of Israel, the Passover, right? Their salvation. What do we have there? A lamb. What else? Unleavened bread. Then he takes them to the wilderness. What do we have there? Manna. Then the, the, the tabernacle is erected and we have all the services. And then what do we have? Actually, the daily peace offering. That is, that is a food supply to, I believe, at least five parties, <laughs> including God. And then he takes them to the good land. And there, oh my, eating, eating, eating. The, the, the produce of the land. And then not only, not only for their enjoyment wherever they live, but at set times each year, the people have to come together with that produce to eat and enjoy mutually with God. Do you see this? <laughs> the, the history of the Old Testament is a history of eating. And then the Lord Jesus comes in the New Testament as the embodiment of the triune God. And when he comes to man, what, what does he do? He presents himself as food. But they don't get it. Hardly anyone got it. They tried to make him king. They thought he would be a ruler, an outward ruler. He performed that miracle of the, the, the feeding of the 5,000. He was trying to show them, you need me as your food. But they, they, they took it wrongly. They thought, oh, he will supply our outward material need, or he can, be a, he can be our ruler. But he said, no, I'm the bread. I am the bread. I'm the living bread that came down out of heaven. Amen. You need to eat me. Oh, they couldn't, they couldn't take that. Many, many stopped there. In Matt, that's, that's, of course, in, uh, we, we see this in several of the Gospels. In Matthew 15, He's there in the north, in Syrophoenicia, right? A Syrophoenician woman comes to him. And she comes, why, why does she come? For healing. So many people came to Christ for different motives. But he liked to present himself as food. And this one, this one, oh, son of David. She thought he was, he was 
uh, uh, someone who could perform miracles and someone of royalty, right? Son of David. But he counters. How? Food. He said, it's not right to throw the ch- take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And oh, somehow that woman got enlightened and said, oh, <laughs> you're, fo- you're the bread. Actually, Lord Jesus, you're not just the bread. I know I'm a dog, but, but I'm a, even a little dog. But you're not just the bread. You're here in Gentile territory, not on the table with the children, but you're the crumbs under the table <laughs> with the doggies. Oh, do, do you see the Lord again and again wants to show himself to us as food? Not only food, crumbs. Can you imagine the triune God? comes to us as crumbs under the table, reaching to wherever we are. Saints, I hope this speaks to us. I don't know where we've been. doesn't matter where we've been. But in our lowest, the Lord is still accessible. The Lord is still reachable. He wants to feed us. He wants to feed us. Then in the epistles, Paul continues this thought. He even says in the Corinthians, Christ is our Passover. Keep the feast. Let us keep the feast. In chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, he talks about the spiritual food, the spiritual drink. Then you go to Revelation. At the end of the the Bible, we know the church became degraded. And what does God do? What does God do? He comes. He comes to try to recover his church. How? Food, food, food. In Revelation 2, 7, to him who overcomes, overcomes what? The losing of the first love. I will give to eat of the tree of life. Recovering, recovering his people back to the beginning. To the, to the worldly church, to Pergamos. To him who overcomes, I will give of the hidden manna. And then to the degraded, recovered church. Laodicea, he's what? I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him. Do you see, <laughs> this, this message is actually on the secret of living a life to overcome, to be an overcomer. Actually, the secret is just this, saints. Eating! We need to overcome to eat. And we need to eat to overcome. And then we go to the last chapter. This has been mentioned again uh, several times already in, in 22.14. This wonderful verse. Blessed are those who wash their robes. Blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have right to the tree of life. God's way, God's way is eating. Saints, by eating, actually, by eating, the testimony of the church is produced. So we see in Ephesus, in, in the epistle to the Ephesians, we saw this last night, or at least the testimony of the church is maintained. The reality of the testimony is maintained by eating. By eating, the Lord will produce the overcomers. By eating, the Lord will produce the man-child. By eating, the Lord will produce the bride. Saints, God's way is eating. Is eating. Okay, now, (laughs) the heart of this message is related to this first question. How do we eat? How do we eat? And in this message, these following four points, Roman numerals 2, 3, 4, and 5, present four ways to eat. Four ways to eat. And the first is related to the word. Okay, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's go there first. We can eat the Lord Jesus as our spiritual food for our enjoyment, receiving him as the spirit who gives life through setting through sorry through eating the words of spirit and life by means of all prayer 
and by musing upon his words. And of course, here we have these, uh, these, these verses in John 6, where he talks about eat me in verse 57, and then in 63, he explains what is eating. What is eating? Eating is not just touching the word, but eating is touching the spirit in the word. And how? How? Well, we have these, uh, continuing with these references, we have Ephesians 6, which is our basis for the practice of pray reading. So pray reading is a way, and we hope, we hope that all our pray reading would really be eating. And not just, not just a form. Not just a form. But here, in this point, we have not just the matter of eating, we also have the matter of musing. Musing. Brother Ed mentioned this in the first, in the first message. And he mentioned this, um, uh, this note in Psalm 119, verse 15. But I don't believe he, uh, he, he read it. So I'd like to read this to you. This is Psalm 119, verse 15, note 1. Rich in meaning, the Hebrew word for muse, often translated meditate in the King James Version, implies to worship, to converse with oneself, and to speak aloud. To muse on the word is to taste and enjoy it through careful considering. Prayer, speaking to oneself, and praising the Lord may also be included in musing on the word. To muse on the word of God is to enjoy his word as his breath, and thus to be infused with God, to breathe God in, and to receive spiritual nourishment. So you see, this matter of musing encompasses our prayer reading, but it's more. It's more. One point here is about speaking aloud and also speaking to oneself. Is your prayer reading like this? <laughs> it can be. You know, actually, I was very touched as a kind of example of this was our brother's testimony last night concerning, um, do you remember that? About loving the Lord. He was praying over John 14, 21. 14, 21. The whole verse says, uh, says this. It says, he who has my commandments and, and keeps them, he is the one who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him. Remember, he emphasized this. And I will love him and will manifest myself to him. And he told us that he was spent some time musing on this. And as he was going over this verse, just this phrase came alive. And I will love him. And I, meaning the Lord, the Lord loving me. The Lord loving me. I will love him. He who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him. I will love him. And our brother described a little bit of the experience. I will love him. Lord, you love me. You know, when, when we're touched like this, it requires a response. And, we, and it's good you say it out loud. Lord, you love me. Lord, you love me. Lord, you love me. Lord, I love you, but I only love you because you love me. Lord, you love me. How can you love me? Maybe there light will come. Some things there that, that mm, some things of darkness. You have to confess. You have to confess to remain in that love. At that point, at that point, actually, it's as if nothing else exists. Just the Lord and I. We are there somewhere. When we have this kind of experience, sometimes, sometimes brothers and sisters, we just want to weep. We should have a time when we have our personal times with the Lord where we are free to weep. Or, or we're free to shout. Oh, Lord, you love me. I can't believe it that you love me. We should, we should have a place where our inner being can be so free. Oh, I hope we can have more experiences of musing on the word. Musing on the word. Okay, uh, point A says, when we eat the Lord Jesus by eating his words of spirit and life, 
We live because of him. This is John 6, 57. And we live, we live not by Christ, but because of Christ as our energizing element and supplying factor. We live Christ in his resurrection, and we live Christ by eating him. Amen. That's the spontaneous issue of our enjoyment of him. We just, we, we just live him without effort. You know, when our brother was speaking last night, you just had the sense out of that love. Lord, you love me. There's no effort there. There's no effort. There's, and saints, a big, a big tactic of the enemy is to tempt us to try to be a Christian without enjoying the Lord. We have a heart for him. So many genuine believers want to serve the Lord, want to love the Lord, but, but not by enjoying him. Point B. Now here, saints, in point B is a very, very practical and I think critical matter regarding the proper spiritual digestion. B. As we eat the Lord Jesus by eating his words, we need to have proper spiritual digestion. Point one says, if we have good digestion, there will be a thoroughfare for the food to get into every part of our inward being. By eating, we have digesting. By digesting, we have assimilation. And by assimilation, we get the practical nourishment of the riches of Christ into our being. Point two says, indigestion means that there is no way for the food as for the Lord as the spiritual food to get through into our inward parts. When there is no free course for the food to get into our inward parts, we will have indigestion. There's a verse uh, referenced here, Hebrews 4, 2. The second part says, but the word heard did not profit them. Saints, have you experienced this? That... uh, a certain time, there was a word. Even you responded to the word. You may have even uh, testified in that meeting when you heard that. Or you read something and you enjoyed and you went to your group meeting and spoke that. But actually, after that, hmm, no profit. There was no continuation of the operation of the word. The Bible says the word of God is living and operative. The word should operate. It can be bread to the sower. It can be grain for food. But it could also be a hammer. There has to be some activity, either positively or negatively in our being. If we're always neutral, that means the word's not working. Why? Why? We have other verses here in Hebrews. There are a number of reasons why. Hebrews 3.12 talks about an evil heart of unbelief. You know, in the, in the New Testament, love and faith go together very much. Last night's message, so much on the love, loving the Lord. If our love is interrupted, if our love wanes, I tell you, faith will wane also. And it's very possible, very possible that our, our faith has been weakened through various circumstances. Paul, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, chapter 3, he, talks, he, he writes to the Thessalonians and says, I, I couldn't bear it anymore. I, I, I had to send one of the brothers to go see how, uh, how is your faith. He wanted to check about their faith, not just how are you doing. How's your faith? Because if our faith is weakened, If our faith is weakened, our heart is affected. It's easy for our heart to get hard, especially if our faith is weakened toward the Lord. We don't trust him. We feel even maybe he disappointed us, let us down. Or our faith in the Lord's sovereignty, our faith in his heart, our faith in his word, our faith in the church, our faith in the brothers, our faith in the Lord's recovery. If that gets affected, saints, oh, I tell you, you try to eat the word, it it will not have any effect. 
just a little maybe feeling or nourishment, but it won't operate. It won't, it won't reach your inward parts. You know, uh, I skipped over this reference. I wanted to, to read this. Ezekiel chapter 3. This is under point B. And he said to me, Son of man, feed your stomach and fill your inward parts with this scroll. It means eat the word. But not just let it get into your stomach. Let it, let it saturate your whole being. We know, saints, that the Lord doesn't just want to come into our spirit. He wants to make his home in all of our heart. But there could be some blockade. There could be some hindrance. Another point here, Hebrews 3.15. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. It's very possible that because of situations, we were not careful. We were not observant. Our heart began to get hard toward the church life, toward the meetings, toward the Lord. Eventually, even possibly a little cynical about the Christian life, about the church life. Oh, saints, we have to guard our hearts. We have to guard our heart. We have to open our heart, open our inner being. Even tell the Lord, 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 keep my heart open to you. Have mercy on me, Lord. You know, we, 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 we said this, that in the garden, God did not give Adam commandments, just eat. But, but Adam, God gave Adam one responsibility, to till the ground and to guard the garden. To till and to guard. And this, brothers and sisters, relates to our heart. Remember, the the Lord is the sower who comes to sow, right? In Matthew 13. He comes with the seed. But he can find, the seed can, can have different welcomes. Welcomed in, by different hearts or different conditions of our heart. We have to take up our responsibility to till the ground. What is to till the ground? To break up the hard ground. To soften the ground so that when the rain comes from heaven, it has effect. There could be, there could be, saints, there could be in our heart just a clutter. Clutter. C-L-U-T-T-E-R. Clutter. There's too many things. Blockading the Lord. This could, be, this could be sin. We surely need to breathe out our sin. You know, in, in musing, that, that, that footnote talks about breathing. But, but breathing has two, two, two parts. It's not just breathing in, but we have to breathe out. You know that wonderful hymn, 255, by Brother A.B. Simpson? If you check most, almost every verse, including the chorus, firstly, it's breathing out, and then breathing in. I'm, I'm breathing out my sorrow. I'm breathing out my sin. I'm breathing, breathing, breathing all thy fullness in. And saints, how much we breathe out will determine how much we can breathe in. Unforgiven offenses could be the blockade. Unfulfilled dreams. Many things in our heart could be, could be that, that, that blockade. Point three says we need to keep our whole being with all our inward parts open to the Lord so that the spiritual food will have a thoroughfare within us If we do this, we will have proper digestion and assimilation. We will absorb Christ as spiritual nourishment, and Christ will become our constituent for the expression of God. You know, in the physical realm, you know, these words, many of these words are taken from the physical example. You have eating, digestion, assimilation, absorption, and eventually constitution for expression. 
God gets his expression by our eating. But then there has to be proper digestion. Oh, saints, our heart is so important in this whole process. May we, may we take up our responsibility to till and to guard. The Lord is faithful. The Lord is faithful to move. By his word, he moves. I believe in this conference already, in different meetings, there's, as, as the brothers are speaking, I know I experienced this certain shining. Oh, that we would not just let that go, but take that home. Go to the Lord. Spend more time and allow him to speak more. And then we breathe out a little and then he comes in a little more and then there's more supply to breathe out even more. And you know what happens when we do that? Our appetite grows. Maybe just a little today through one little dealing with the Lord, our appetite grows. But saints, the enemy attacks our appetite through all the things around us, from the world, from our soul life. May we give him the best cooperation. Okay, Roman 3. In Roman 3, we come to the second way of eating. We can eat him by doing the will of the Father to satisfy the hungry and thirsty ones and by glorifying the Father on earth in living the life of a God-man for the glory of the processed triune God. Now, saints, uh, this point actually might be a bit new to some of us. We eat by doing the will of the Father. Actually, this point has two subpoints in it. And by glorifying the Father on earth in living the life of a God man. Now, these two points come from two sets of verses which are in the outline A and B. Let's look at A and B. A is from John 4, verses, portions of verses 42, uh, sorry, 32 and 34. I have food to eat that you do not know about. My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Now, I believe many of us are familiar with this portion and maybe with this application. That when we minister to the hungry ones, when we preach the gospel, when we shepherd people, in feeding them, we get fed. Have you experienced this? I think almost all of us have experienced this. And this is true. However, there, that's one level. I hope that we could see something deeper here. Actually, what the Lord said is, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. It just so happened that in, at that point, what was the Father's will? The Father's will was meet the need of this one. Lord, the Lord Jesus was there, wearied from the journey, and the woman came, and, and, and he could have said, I'm a bit tired today, right now. I'll wait for the disciples to come. The disciples went into town to get some, some food. He could have said that. Maybe we would say that. But no, he took the Father's will. He put himself aside and he met her need. And also, incidentally, presented himself as food or as water. She talked about worship. He talked about water. The point is that he was doing the Father's will. And it just so happened that in that instant, instance, it was ministering to someone else. But, but look, at, look at point B. I have glorified you on earth. This is John 17, 4. I have glorified you on earth, finishing the work which you have given me to do. To glorify God is to express God in all things. You know, the Lord said this the night before his crucifixion. He said, I have 
I have glorified you on earth, finishing the work. Finishing the work. What work is he talking about? Surely on the cross, there was a work. On the cross, he said at one time, it is finished. That's the work of redemption. We have no part in that. But here, he's talking about something else. What is the Father's work? The Father's work is that there would be a man on the earth, one with God, glorifying and expressing God. You know, when I was a young believer, I, 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 I talked to the Lord this way. I wondered, Lord, uh, because I thought his mission was redemption, fully. So, so I said, Lord, if you came to die, and I love that, I mean, I, I, that's wonderful, uh, but why did you take so long? 33 and a half years. And Lord Jesus, you had a life of suffering. You were, the, you were a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Why go through all that? Why, saints? This is the answer. The Lord was actually establishing a model of the God-man living. Establishing a pattern of someone who lives absolutely in oneness with the Father and expresses God in all situations. Not just in preaching the gospel. Not just in working for the Lord. Not just in serving, but in living. Point C says, in, in, in his human living, the Lord ate butter, which is the richest grace, and honey, the sweetest love, which gave him the power to always choose the Father's will. This is Isaiah 7, 14 and 15. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and will bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey until he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. You know, here it says, in, this is the recovery version, curds and honey. But in the, in the point, we say butter and honey. This is from the, the uh, ASV 1901, which is also an excellent translation. And Brother Nee has an article entitled, The Power to Choose. Oh, I really recommend that. Where he develops this point, that the Lord ate, the Lord Jesus ate butter and honey. What is butter? Something so rich. It's the, 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 the richest grace. What is the honey? Honey is the sweetest love. All the time, he was under the supply of the Father's grace and love. And so he had the power to choose, always to choose God the Father's will. You know, in the, in the wilderness, in the temptation in the wilderness, what was the goal of the enemy? What was he trying to do? He was trying to get the Lord Jesus, even at least one time, to do his own will. To act on his own. But the Lord Jesus had the power to choose. The power to choose the Father's will all the time. Even, even as a boy, 12 years old. You know that story in Luke 2? He's 12 years old. I don't know if in the congregation we have anybody 12 years old or younger. But they're young people. They're, in this example... The Lord can supply you. The Lord can be your butter and honey. <laughs> and be your power to choose. You know, he was there. He, he had come with his family to, to the feast. And, and then he, was, he wanted to be in the things of the Father and the temple. And then the family left. And then they realized, oh, we left him behind. So they came. And then they found him in the temple. They said, come. And he, oh, I wonder what was his feeling there. He wanted to be in the things of the Father. But you know what? As a 12-year-old, the right thing to do, the right thing to do is obey your mommy and daddy. So this God-man, he obeyed his mommy and daddy. He had the power to choose. Yeah, young people, you have the power to choose. To choose not to go along with the rebellion of the age. Not to go along with the rebellion in your natural life, but to say, amen, mommy. That's the power to choose. 
to choose the Father's will. In point D, we are those who are learning Christ as the reality is in Jesus. This is from Ephesians chapter 4. The reality in, is in Jesus refers to the actual condition of the life of the Lord Jesus as recorded in the four Gospels. A life in which he glorified the Father on earth to set up a pattern for his believers. You know, later on, uh, under point Roman 1, we have this verse reference, 1 Peter 2.21. It says, For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered on your behalf, leaving you a model so that you may follow in his steps. What what is this, and how does it relate to this topic of eating? The reality is in Jesus, this phrase, the definition is right here, is the actual condition of the life of the Lord Jesus recorded in the Gospels. Now, from the time I was a young believer, I loved to read the Bible. I was was shepherded into reading the Bible, And I think this is very common for many of us and for many believers all over the earth. When you read the Gospels, you're inspired by the Lord Jesus. And we may not actually realize the influence of the four Gospels on us. You know, some years ago, I don't know if they still do this, but 20, 25 years ago, there was this kind of movement. uh, What? WWJD, right? Even, Even young people would wear... Band, wristbands and, and so on. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it seems to me this has faded some because you can't do it. You can't do it. But I would encourage you, I encourage saints, don't despise the desire. Don't despise that, that spark that you get when, when you read the, the example of the Lord Jesus. It inspires us. But it's never God's intention that we would try to copy that and just, okay, what would, Lord, what would you do? No, no, no. Here it says, you did not so learn Christ. Is Ephesians 4.20. If indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him as the reality is in Jesus. You know, this, these are all actually in the past tense. You did not so learn Christ, but have been taught in him. You know what this is referring to? Actually, in our baptism, saints, in our baptism, we we were put into the mold of Christ and his death. Of God, we are in Christ. Christ, God put us into this pattern of Jesus and his human living. This is the model that we should follow in his steps, but not by our imitation and natural energy. After the Lord died, crucified, of course, he was resurrected to become the spirit, to come into us. Now, saints, we have the life of the pattern. We have the life of the pattern. You know what we need to do? Is actually eat the pattern. We need to eat him, and he will reproduce himself in us. In, as a normal human living. One with the Father's will. Always one with the Father. And saints, if we have that reality, have, have that reality, then we are one with the Lord, according to John seventeen four. I have glorified you on earth, finishing the work you have given me to do. What is our top service to the Lord? Our top service is not how many people you can get saved. Our top service is to express him. Now, as we're expressing him, people are drawn to Christ, and we share the gospel. But actually, saints, our living is our service, and our service is our work. And actually, that work becomes our food. That's what the Lord said in John 4. My food is to do the will of him who sent me. Saints, whenever we are one spirit with the Lord and in oneness with the Lord doing his will, 
We are what? We're one with him under a kind of dispensing supply. And that doing of his will, that doing of his will is doing the Father's work. And that doing of the work is our food, is our supply. I hope we could get something from this. Point two says, the Lord Jesus never did anything out of himself. He did not do his own work. He did not speak his own word. He did not do his own will. And he did not speak his own glory. I remember our dear brother Lee presenting these five points when I was a young person. On one hand, so inspired. Oh, Lord Jesus, what a God man. Have you ever had that kind of response? Wow, what a humanity, what, what, a, what a God man. And then shortly after, oh, I could never do that. <laughs> Did you ever feel that way? But the reason I felt that way was because I was eating the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And I did not have this drastic change in concept that the Lord wants me to eat him. Eat the pattern. Saints, these these verses, let's just go through just quickly these verses in John. Don't shy away from these verses. Muse over these verses. Let these verses speak to you and supply you. Uh, John 5.19 says, The Son can do nothing from himself. Oh, that we could just muse, Los, oh Lord, you, you, you never did anything from yourself. Lord, Lord, I, I want the same, Lord. I want the same. Come and live in me. I want to be freed from myself. In, in uh, John 4.34, and to finish his work. Lord, I don't want to work apart from you. I don't want to serve apart from you. Lord, I have the heart to serve, but I don't want to be apart from you. Lord, do your work in me and with me. In John 14, 10, the words that I say to you, I do not speak from myself. Oh, the words, Lord, the words that that I say to you. Lord, my words. Lord, my, oh, Lord, my words. Maybe you would say, oh, Lord, my words. Lord, my words. My words to my spouse. Lord, I don't want them to be from myself. Lord, my words to my children, I don't want them to be from myself. Lord, my words to my co-worker. Lord, even even my joking with my co-workers, I don't want it to be from myself. Lord, I want your words. Just, Just pray over, muse, let the word speak to you. The word of God is living and operative. The word itself will operate on us and take us to where we need to be. Okay, let's go on to uh, point three. To learn Christ is simply to be molded into the pattern of Christ. That is to be conformed to the image of Christ. He himself as the indwelling spirit, the law of the spirit of life, with all the riches of his life, reproduces himself in us. Amen. Okay, E. Isaiah 43, 7. I think Brother Ed mentioned this verse also on uh, Friday night. Everyone who is called by my name, whom I have created, formed, and even made for my glory, the highest service we can render to God is to express him. And saints, (laughs) I do hope that we could uh, have some prayerful consideration over this point. To glorify God is the Father's will. And when we do the Father's will, that is our service. And that service becomes our food. As I was praying over this, I thought of so many sisters who are the stay-at-home moms, who may be at one time in the church life so active and doing this and that, even so happy, but now two, three, four children... 24 hours a day, at home, maybe considering a little prison. Sisters, sisters, I like to tell you, the highest service we can render to God is to express his glory. Do you know, if, 
when, if you're just one with the Father in his will, one with the Father, and just, just have a heart, just have a heart till the ground, till the ground, that, that you could be one with the Father as you're with the children. You're serving. And that service can be your food. There's a supply to live Christ. Saints, I hope we can eat the pattern. Eat the pattern. Okay, F says, 1 Corinthians 6.20 says, You have been bought with a price, so then glorify God in your body. This is to allow God, who dwells in us, to occupy and saturate our body and express himself through our body as his temple. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Saints, may, may we be those who <laughs> eat him, allow him to operate within us, and just become our constituent, and express him, even through our body. Even through our body. You know, 2 Corinthians 5.10 says that when we see him, we will all have to give an account for the things done through our body, our eyes, the things we look, we see, our tongue, our lips, our, what we've listened to, our ears, our hands and our feet. Oh, oh, that our, our body would glorify God. We were created to glorify God in our spirit, our soul, and our body. Okay, Roman 4, another very practical point. We can eat him by contacting the proper people. A says, to eat is to contact things outside of us and to receive them into us with the result that they eventually become our inner constitution. In Leviticus 11, all the animals signify different kinds of people. And eating signifies our contacting of people. For God's people to live a holy life as required by the holy God, they must be careful about the kind of people they contact. And of course, these, these points, as you can see, come from Leviticus 11 and Acts 10. And the matter of the discernment and diet, the proper diet, is one of the pillars of Judaism, what God gives the regulations to his people in the Old Testament. And Peter, who was raised in such an orthodox way, he, he, he had never eaten anything unclean. And now he's there in Acts 10, and he's praying. And what happens? What happens? It says in, in Acts 10, in these uh, verses 9 to 14, I'll just read a portion. Uh, um, and a certain vessel, like a great sheet descending, being let down by four corners on the earth, in which were all the four-footed animals and reptiles of the earth and birds of heaven. And a voice came to him, Rise up, Peter, slay and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common and unclean. So he's going according to the regulation. But, but then, in... in Later on in chapter 10, <laughs> what happens is from, from Cornelius. Cornelius sends some to go find Paul, the Lord, the, uh, Peter. The, the Lord uh, spoke to Cornelius in this way to, you know, this is really miraculous. And the Lord went and Peter came. And when he came to that assembly of people in Cornelius' house, he says this. He says, yes. Uh, no, let's see. Yeah, yeah. Yet God has shown me that I should not call any man common and unclean. So he got the revelation. Praise the Lord. Peter was open. And he saw that actually to, to eat the animals in the Old Testament signifies our contacting different kinds of people. And in the regulations in Leviticus 11, there are, there are four categories of clean things that we can eat. And five categories unclean. Stay away. And in the following points, in the following points, uh, we develop these uh, four proper categories uh, that we should eat. But first, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to point this out. 
Saints, we, we have to be careful in contacting people. 1 Corinthians, this is in the references here, 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Do not be deceived. Evil companionships corrupt good morals. Our companionships, the people that we spent, have our intimate contact with, you may not be so aware, but whatever they are, whatever is within them, comes into us and affects us. And we then... In, uh, this verse is not, n- not listed here, but I want to read Proverbs 13, 20. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be troubled. That's the recovery version. The King James Version says, will be destroyed. The companion of fools will be destroyed. And we've seen this. Have you not seen this? Or I should ask, have you not experienced this? With certain coworkers, neighbors, friends, Relatives, even, even saints. Some things there that affected us negatively because in our contact we didn't realize it's not just contact, it's receiving. We receive something. And, and what we receive gets into us and changes us. Okay, let's look at the four categories. B, animals that divide the hoof and chew the cud signify persons who have discernment in their activities and who receive the word of God with much reconsideration. Brother Ed already talked about this matter of chewing the cud, musing over the word and its effect on us. Actually, saints, chewing the cud, having that kind of Fellowship with the Lord in the Word will give us the proper discernment. Divide the hoof. That, that, that signifies persons with proper discernment. Saints, there, there, there are people who do not appreciate heavenly things. To them, heaven, earth, all the same. They, they, they have no thought or concept of of the unseen things. Only the seen things. Seen things are important. Unseen things don't exist to them. It's very possible to be affected by our co-workers in the job place, by neighbors, by their home. You go to someone's home and, and something there just touches you. Actually, we covet. Even more, eternal. There's the eternal and the temporary. Most people just care for the temporary, what's in front of you. Saints, we are people of eternity. Isaiah 5.20 in Isaiah 5.20, it talks about this category of people. That say, they say, what is good is evil. And what is evil is good. They say, you, they, take, they take darkness for light and light for darkness. We have to be careful. They take bitter for sweet, sweet for bitter. If we contact people who say what's what's evil is good, that can get into us. And eventually we say, wait, wait, actually, I know the Bible says this, but, but what about this? Haven't you seen saints affected this way? Young people affected this way? And not only contacting people, saints, words, People's words. There is a power in words. Today, you, we're we're up till now. I've been talking about intimate contacts with your, in physical contact with your coworkers, relatives. But, but, I don't have a device here, a phone here. But through that device, words come. All day long, no. 
It's even called a news feed, Twitter feed. Amen. Thanks, Lord. I will share message five. The secret of living the Christian life to be an overcomer, taking the way of eating and enjoying Christ as the tree of life. Amen. We need have two questions: How we eat Christ properly, and another question: Why after we eat Christ, but we have no enough enjoyment and not enjoy at all? The day we eat Christ. Properly, what should we do? In Roman numeral two, we can eat the Lord Jesus as our spiritual food for our enjoyment, receiving Him as the Spirit who gives life through eating His words of spirit and life by means of all prayer. This is the proper way, by means of all prayer and by musing upon His words. Amen. Point A: When we eat the Lord Jesus by eating His words of spirit and life, we live because of Him. We live not by Christ, but because of Christ as our energizing element and supplying factor. Dear brothers and sisters, we live Christ in His resurrection, and we live Christ by eating Him. Point B, as we eat the Lord Jesus by eating His words, we need to have proper spiritual digestion. If we have good digestion, there will be several fair for the food to get into every part of our inward being. By eating, we have digesting. By digesting, we have assimilation. And by our simulation, we get the practical nourishment of the riches of Christ into our being. The day the bark for food and Christ to get into our being is our heart. In digestion, in point two, reveals us that there is no way for the spiritual food to get through into our inward parts because of our heart. Hebrews three twelve. Say an evil heart of unbelief. Hebrews three fifteen. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Amen. If our heart open to Lord, we say to the Lord, May Lord keep my heart to open to the Lord. May mercy me keep my heart. We need to keep our whole being, with all our inward parts, to open to Lord, so that the spiritual food we have and sorrow fear within us. If we do this, we have proper digestion and assimilation. We will observe Christ as spiritual nourishment, and Christ will become our constituent for the expression of God. Praise the Lord, Amen. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. In Roman number three, we can eat Him by doing the will of the Father to satisfy the hunger, the thirsty ones, and God by glorifying the Father on earth in living the life of God of a God man for the glory of the process of triune God. Amen. Today, Jesus said in John four thirty two and thirty four, "I have food to eat that you do not know about. My food is to do the will of Him who sent me and to finish His work. This is the will of the Son that He wants us to see and live such a life." Thank you, God. Jesus also said in. John fourteen um seventeen four. I have glorified on earth. We also have to glorify Him on earth corporately, because I have finished the work which You have given me to do. Hallelujah! He had finished the work on the cross. He has redeemed us. Jesus has become the life giving Spirit, and now we are expressing the life giving Spirit. Who is the law of life within us corporately? To glorify God is to express God in all things. 
Thank you, God. On his side, in his human living, the Lord ate butter and honey. Today, we also have to eat butter and honey, which is a richest grace, and honey, the sweetest love. Thank you, God. This love is in the Father, in the Son, and also in us, because the Son is in us, and we are building ourselves up in love. Thank you, God, which gave him the power to always choose the Father's will. Today, if we enjoy the Lord, we will have this power to always choose God's will. On our side, we need to have the reality in Jesus. We have to learn from him in this matter. This is the love that God has for us. Jesus' living is recorded in the four Gospels that we have to enjoy. To see his living, to seek the Father's will, to glorify the Father on earth. This is to its example to all the believers in the four Gospels. Praise the Lord. And the burden in Roman numeral 3 is we have to glorify the Lord with our body. To let God who is living within take over and saturate in our body and express Him through our body, which is His temple. In 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, Whether you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Amen. We have to see this. This is the burden that we have to live out, for God's will be done corporately within us. And we will corporately glorify the Father on earth. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. We can eat him by contacting the proper people. All the animals in Leviticus 11 signify different kinds of people. And eating signifies our contacting of people. For God's people to live a holy life, as required by the Holy God, they must be careful about the kind of people they contact. We have to contact the proper people so we can eat and enjoy Him as a tree of life for us to be the overcomer. B said, Animals that divide the hoof and shield the cut signify persons who have discernment in their activities and who receive the word of God with much reconciliation. If we contact this kind of people, we will surely be able to eat and enjoy the word of God. See, aquatic animals that have fins and scales signify persons who can move and act freely in the world, and at the same time, resist its influence. For the church life, for God's eternal plan, for the fellowship of the churches in Thailand and Laos. Brothers and sisters, we should be like fish that have fins and scales moving freely, not binded. Whether job, our pet. I also have a pet, but this pet doesn't bind me. Our children, our, our wife, can bind us. We have to take our family to serve Jehovah, go out to propagate together, preach the gospel together, oh, so sweet. With this living, this world can consume us. We will not have time to fight, but we will be full of enjoyment to have the opportunity to eat, drink, and enjoy the Lord together as a family. This will make us an overcomer. D. Birds that have wings for flying and that eat seeds of life as their food supply signify persons who can live and move in a life that is away from and above the world and who can take things of life as their life supply. E. Insects that have wings and have legs above their feet for living on the ground signify persons who can live and move in a life that is above the earth and who can keep themselves from the world. 
Thank you, God. We have to contact with these kind of people for us to eat and enjoy the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Thanks, the Lord. In this message, the brothers have fellowship with us, especially that the secret of living the Christian life is to be an overcomer by taking the way of eating and enjoying Christ as the tree of life, especially in the way of practice. In Roman number 5, says that we need to eat him by feasting on him in the meetings on the ground of oneness. We can enjoy whenever and wherever in our personal aspect, but to enjoy the topmost portion of the experience of Christ must be in a corporate way. In the proper church side, we can enjoy the top and the best portion of Christ on the unique ground of oneness. Therefore, brothers and sisters, I would like to share about the practice of the children meeting. Before COVID-19 pandemic, in each locality, we have the practice of the children meeting, helping the children to enjoy the Lord, not only at home as the personal aspect, but also in a corporate way, bringing them to the group meeting, enjoying the topmost portion of Christ. However, it's a pity that due to COVID-19, many children meetings are dismissed. Many children are lost and not having the practice of the online children meeting. Therefore, may the Lord have mercy on us through this kind of message that we may give the proper care for the recovery of the corporate living, not only in the personal aspect at home, but the sister in a church, in every locality, there must be a recovery to recover children to come back to the proper church life that they may enjoy the top portion of Christ in early age. Because in Roman numeral 6, God's intention for man was to give himself as the tree of life to man for him to enjoy. Since Genesis, the purpose of creating man was to put man in the Garden of Eden that man may enjoy the tree of life. But due to the fall of man, man has lost this portion. God then becoming man himself passed through 33 and a half years of human living, crucifixion, resurrection, ascension, becoming the life-giving spirit. The goal is to dispense the eternal life into us, becoming our enjoyment from his creation to the fall of man to the recovery. The goal is for man to enjoy this life. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we hope that we need to help the children to have this vision in early age to enter into the proper church life in a definite place and join the topmost portion of Christ because this is the intention of God toward man. When we have this kind of living, enjoying the tree of life, we are naturally able to live the church life. This kind of living would uphold us, help us that we may become the overcomers. Praise the Lord. The only way is to eat Christ, enjoy Christ, as the tree of life.